Good morning, everyone. Good to have you all here and uh, to be with, uh, with the family and be able to uh, just talk with one another and spend a little time together. Uh, as we begin our service this morning, I uh, would ask that we all join together as we uh, go to our Father in prayer as we begin our service this morning. Our Father in heaven, we just give all praise, all honor, and glory to you. For truly, Father, you are great. You do all things. You've created all things. And you sent your Son to be the sacrifice that uh, would save us and our souls for eternity with you. Father, as we begin our service this morning, we pray that you would be with us as a family of yours. Give us the uh, open hearts and minds to, to hear your word, to worship you in, in truth and in ways that will be pleasing to you. Father, we, we know that at this time that uh, we are undergoing some difficult challenges with this COVID. We pray that you give us uh, confidence in you and trust in you that uh, it will all work out to your glory. Father, as we uh, work together today and study together, we pray that uh, you'd give uh, Derek uh, the mind and the heart that uh, he needs to give us that message and pray that we would, pray that we would receive, it, uh, receive it in our hearts as well. Be with those, Father, that are not able to be with us this morning. Uh, for whatever reason, we know that, uh, for example, that Pam has uh, broken her arm. Uh, we pray for, for those also that are not able to be with us. We pray, Father, for uh, just us as a body, that you would watch over us and care for us. For we ask all this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, professional singers. You did very well. <laughs> I'm not sure why that did not pick up. That didn't, didn't play. Hopefully, uh, it's solving itself, whatever is going to happen there. Before we take part in this memorial of Jesus' suffering and sacrifice this morning, let's reflect a moment as to how our lives demonstrate the appreciation for what God has done for us by his grace through that sacrifice. I'd like each of us to contemplate as to whether you are living a life that reflects the, atti the attitude of cheap grace or costly grace. Cheap grace is a life where we accept his grace without taking any real initiative to make things right. So we carry on as if there was no transgression. We resolve our issues like the rest of the world, modeled on the world's standards. Cheap grace is accepting his grace without a personal connection to our Lord, living Lord, Jesus Christ. And think of him more in terms of a long lost distant brother. Cheap grace is accepting his grace without any thought regarding Jesus' re rejection, suffering, or indignity on the cross, as if you have no share in, in his suffering. Cheap grace is a life carried on under the assumption of being justified by him, but without justification of a sinner's heart. The cheap grace is the acceptance of forgiveness without an obligatory repentance and obedience. Cheap grace is a communion without the personal acknowledgement of your sins. Or are we living a life of costly grace? A costly grace is a treasure hidden in a field. And for the sake of it, you would gladly go and sell all you have to hold it close to your, yourself as your own. A costly grace is a pearl of great price for which the merchant sells all he has to acquire it. A costly grace is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out his own eye that causes him to stumble and be separated from his king. A costly grace is when we, called by Jesus Christ, gladly, we are gladly leave our nets and follow him, seeking a closer and closer relationship with him. A costly grace is the gospel which must be sought each and every day, overcoming every obstacle. It's a gift in order, which in order to receive it, you must go through the door that he leaves open for us to accept our place in the mansion that he has prepared for us. Such costly grace such grace is costly grace because it calls us to step down from the throne and allows him to rule in our place as king. And it's grace because he has chosen you to follow him. It's costly because it costs a man his life. And it's grace because it gives a man the only true life. It's costly because it condemns sin. And it's grace because it justifies the sinner. 
Above all, it's costly because it costs God the life of his only son. And what has cost God that much cannot be accepted cheaply by us. It's grace because God loves you so much that the life of his son was not too dear a price to pay for your sin. Costly grace confronts us through Jesus' gracious call to follow him. It comes as a word of forgiveness to the broken spirit in the con contrite heart. God's grace is costly because it compels a disciple to submit to the yoke of Christ and follow him. Please reflect on these comments. <coughs> Excuse me. Reflect a moment as to how your life reflects the appreciation of what God has done for you through Jesus' sacrifice. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful for Jesus and the sacrifice that he went through for us. Help us to appreciate what he has done. Help us to understand the new life that we have through his sacrifice, that we can indeed come closer to you because of it, which we really have no um, right to do on our own, but we know that we can only do that because of what you have done for us. Help us to examine ourselves and understand how much it cost you and that we too may share in the suffering that he went through for us. Be with us as we remember those things. Bless us and continue to help us to be turning our lives over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us, let us give thanks for uh, what God has done for us this week, that we too participate in giving back to him. 
We're so thankful, Father, for this time that we are able to come together and to express our lives under your Son. Help us, Father, to participate in that sacrifice that he made for us by giving back a portion of that which you have given us and to show our appreciation for him and for what you have done for us. Be with us as we continue to do the things that you command of us. Help us to obey always. In Jesus' name, amen. Say it, Lord, from the start. Thank you for bringing me through my life. Thank you for giving me every chain of my heart. When I was lost, you made a way. You turned the darkest night to day. You are my joy and all I'd like to say. You never know. <laughs> I'm sitting there and I'm trying to sing. Michelle's like, no, you're wrong. And <laughs> like, <laughs> somebody's got to do something. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me okay? Can everybody hear me okay? So, Alan, the, that was a great um, table thought. We didn't work that out in any way. But really what you were referring to was the worth of Jesus' sacrifice. The worth that we put on things. Now, um, in the lesson today, we're going to look at the two ways in which worth can be described. It can be described as a noun. 
the definition, let me make sure that order is right, yeah. The value equivalent of that of someone or something under consideration, the level at which someone or something deserves to be value or rated. The, the, the sentence that was used that I thought it was kind of cheesy but it worked was they had to listen to every piece of gossip and judge its worth. So if you're listening, you're judging things as you're going along and you're listening, judging what its worth is. The adjective equivalent in value to the sum or item specified. The jewelry that was stolen was worth about 450 bucks. So you can put a, a, a dollar amount on something. So as I said, worth is going to be looked at here subjectively. So as I'm going through and I'm reading these um, lessons from the word and you're looking at the pictures, because I love pictures, you guys know that, as, you're gonna, as we're going to go through that, you're going to see the pictures and describe and you're going to, we're all going to use our brains and come up with what we put the value or the worth of something to be. So you go to the next spot. A good fishing spot is worth a lot on the market these days. It is prime real estate. No? Terrible. <laughs> you know, a real, a fishing reel, real estate. Oh, now I can. Wow. <laughs> so, these guys over here are not humored whatsoever. <laughs> Worth can be used as an adjective or a noun. There are examples of both in scripture where we can see worth as an adjective or a noun. When looking at the noun form of worth, we're gonna look at two examples. We're gonna look at the two examples of the value of wisdom. So we're gonna take wisdom, break that down and to see what its worth is from a noun perspective. We can look at Solomon. It's like a song service all over again. <laughs> It'll be great when Bob's leading singing again. <laughs> and Jim, even <laughs> for what it's worth. We can look at Solomon. We can look at all of the, that he was the richest person that ever lived. And God appeared to him in a dream. Had to go back and reread this story this lesson from the Bible, it wasn't a prayer in an aspect of which uh, Solomon asked for wisdom, but he got it out of, a, out of a dream. He saw God come to him and ask Solomon, what shall I give you? A discerning heart and an understanding mind was Solomon's response. We find this in uh, 1, Kings, 1 Kings 3, 1 through 15. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house in the house of the Lord in the wall around Jerusalem. The people were sacrificing at the high places, however, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statues, statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for there was a great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings at the altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God, God said, ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness in righteousness and an uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and gave him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of, you, of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or continued for multitude or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people. 
that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life, or riches, or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. When was the last time that you had read that lesson? Do you see the worth of what it is to ask for God, what it is, what, what it is that you're at, what you want? Or what, what it is that you want God to give to you? All it was was asking. What worth is that to you? What worth is wisdom to you? Then you can also look at Job. This is Job during his period of having everything taken from him. But he still puts value in wisdom. He talks about it with God. He talks about it with his friends. In Job 28, 12 through 19... But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its worth. And it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it's not in me. The sea says, it's not with me. It cannot be bought for gold. And silver cannot be weighed in its price. As its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir. Or precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. This is someone who we all know from the lesson had everything taken from him because God allowed it to happen. But still yet he is finding value He is finding the worth of wisdom and in a relationship with God. We can also look at worth in the form of the adjective, in the adjective form. We'll look at two examples of the worth in the form of an adjective. And when we look at this from from this perspective, we then can ask ourselves, what is my worth or what is more worthy than I am? What has more worth than I do in the sight of God? Are there things that we have or things that God has made, made aware to us that are worth more than just ourselves? And I think we're going to find those answers. Paul describes that his life is worth more only because it means that Christ would be proclaimed. But also, too, in Luke chapter 12, verses 6 through 7, and I tried to find a picture of sparrows and to put it in perspective. Because every picture was them on a branch or them flying. So this was the only one where I could find where to put in perspective how small a sparrow is. That's barbed wire that they're sitting on. Right? <clears throat> Luke chapter 12, verses 6 through 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. God doesn't forget about the sparrows. Even though they're worth pretty much worthless, because we equate them to being worth two pennies, we are are worth way more than that. And he still remembers those sparrows that we don't put any value on. Okay, so when Paul describes what his, his life is worth, we all know that in Philippians chapter 1, 
verse 21, it says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's putting a value on something. That's putting a, a worth. So in, the, in, the, in that context, Philippians 1, 19 through 26, this is the first instance where we're going to use the worth as an adjective. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers... And the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am not to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yes, which I choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. That's, that's subjective to Paul. He's putting value in being with Christ as opposed to living. Shouldn't we all be doing that same thing? But what is the value or the worth of him being on earth? But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. The encouragement, the worth of encouraging and being together with each other, the worth of praising and speaking about who God is to the people that are around us. But we also know how Paul was killed. Much better. Paul was decapitated. Paul was decapitated. So his his uh, description of the value of life is proclaimed in Acts chapter twenty. He knew he didn't know what was going to happen. He knew that he knew that he was going to go to Jerusalem. He knew that he was going to go to Jerusalem, but he didn't know where he was going to go after that. But he knew he was going to be a tool for God. And he put a value on that and a worth to himself. <clears throat> and, when, and this is Paul now going to um, gather the elders at Ephesus. And this is what he says to the elders at Ephesus. And when they came to him, he said to them, this is Acts twenty seventeen through 24. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials, what happened to me through the plot of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where he put his value. That's where he put what was worth, worthwhile to him. He wanted to teach and to preach, and that's what he did. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, con- constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and affliction awaits me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That is his value. That is his worth. He wants to testify to the people around him the glory of God. Okay, this is the last slide. Couldn't find anything where it was described as if you were going into heaven because To me, that is the ultimate in subjectivity. You know what the value of going to heaven means because you have already decided this is what my life is about. Now, I'm talking at myself here as much as I'm going to talk to you in this next paragraph, okay? Because as I move along through my life and my kids get older, these three are leaving tomorrow. And they're going to be gone for two weeks, just the three of them. So I'm 
I know that between Michelle and I, we've prayed long and hard about this trip that they're about to take and that we have done our best to show them the, the, the value that Christ is to us. All these things equate to a simple definition of worth. And again, this is subjective, but this is, I'm up here and you're not, so. <laughs> what are you putting before your worth of getting into heaven? What are you putting before, what are you putting in a value of worth before getting into heaven? I challenge you as I'm challenging myself right now. And I'm going to do a short-term goal here because long-term goals can get lost. But between today and this week, I challenge you, place your relationship with Jesus as your Savior above your family, above your friends, and above your job. These are hard things for me to say. There's hard things maybe to accept. But isn't this what we are called to do? We are called to put our relationship in the worth of getting into heaven above everything else. I struggle with it, but I'm going to make a, a challenge for today and a challenge for this week. And I'm going to have a, a, lot, a lot of traveling coming up this week for me my, in particular, but I, I challenge you to do that for this week. Because getting into heaven should be above everything else for us. If that's something that you struggle with, something that you'd like to put more value on, we're here to help. We're here to encourage one another and to pray together. Understanding that it is because of Jesus that we're here today. Because of his sacrifice. And the representation that we have through baptism of his death burial and resurrection to live a new life if that's something that interests you today that you would like to more discussion about or that you need prayers about I ask that you reach out to one of the elders one of the deacons someone that you're close with ask the question and we'll be here to help and now we're going to sing us we're going to sing a song or we're going to listen to a song both I hope thank you
Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Derek, for the lesson this morning. As far as announcements, uh, please see the bulletin. It's an extensive prayer list. There's some paper copies out in the foyer, and electronic copies were sent by Beverly uh, last night. So either way, yeah, you can see the um, complete uh, prayer list. Um, just to give you an update, especially on Pam, she's still in the hospital. Um, her arm was broken, humerus, I think it was her right side, right arm, up near the shoulder. But it was a clean break, I guess if anything could be good. It was a clean break, no surgery is planned. Um, it's not casted yet, the doctors still haven't decided. Maybe they'll just keep it immobilized. Uh, she will be going uh, to rehab, so she will not be going directly home, which is probably a good thing. And uh, she would uh, appreciate phone calls, uh, use her cell phone, and you can call her um, directly. Also, a friend of the Waltons, uh, the father had passed. Their friend is, last name is Johnson. What's her first name? Tina. Tina? Tina, Tina Johnson's father, Francesco Alfano, passed away, and is a friend uh, of the Waltons. Um, does anybody have anything else before we are dismissed that they want to bring to the body? If not, well, let's bow our heads and we'll. Go to our Father in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time you gave to us this morning to worship you and to sing songs of praise and to, to hear from your lesson as well as fellowshipping, fellowshipping with one another. Father, we ask for your continued blessings and your continued grace on this body of Christ here in Half Moon. Please be with those in our number who are away and traveling and those on our prayer list, Father, we ask that you intervene in your, in your way and on your time. You intervene with those who we offer up in prayer to you. Be with us, Father, now as we leave this place. Guide us. Be with us as we interact with others outside of this building. Help the light of Christ shine outward from us to all those we, we meet and talk with. We offer this prayer in Christ's Holy name, amen.